from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of BizOps Manifesto Unveiled, brought to you by BizOps Coalition. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. Welcome back to our ongoing coverage of the BizOps Manifesto Unveiling. It's been in the works for a while, but today's the day that it actually kind of come out to the, to the public and we're excited to have a real industry luminary here to talk about what's going on, why this is important, and share his perspective. And we're uh, happy to have from Cape Cod, I believe, is Tom Davenport. He is a distinguished author uh, and professor at Babson College. We could go on, he's got a lot of great titles and, and really a luminary in the area of big data and analytics. Tom, it's great to see you. Thanks, Jeff. Happy to be here with you. Great, so let's just jump into it, you know, and getting ready for this, I, I came across your LinkedIn post, I think you did it earlier this summer in June, and right off the bat, the first sentence just grabbed my attention. I'm always interested in new attempts to address long-term issues uh, in how technology works within businesses. BizOps, what did you see in BizOps uh, that, that kind of addresses one of these really big long-term problems? Well, yeah, the, the long-term problem is that we've had a poor connection between um, business people and IT people between business objectives and the IT solutions that address them. This has been going on, I think, since the beginning of information technology, and sadly, it hasn't gone away. And so BizOps is a new attempt to deal with that issue with a, you know, a new framework, eventually a broad set of solutions that increase the likelihood that will actually solve a business problem with an IT capability. Right, you know, it's interesting to compare it with like DevOps, which I think a lot of people are, are probably familiar with, which was, you know, built around a, a agile software development and a theory that we want to embrace change, that, that change is okay, uh, and we want to be able to iterate quickly and incorporate that. And that's been happening in the software world for, for 20 plus years. What's taken so long to get that to the business side? Because as the pace of change has changed on the software side, you know that's a strategic issue in terms of execution on the business side that they need now to change priorities. And you know, there's no PRDs and MRDs and big giant strategic plans that sit on the shelf for five years. That's just not the way business works anymore. It took a long time to get here. Yeah, it did. And you know, there have been previous attempts to make a better connection between business and IT. There was the so-called strategic alignment framework that a couple of uh, friends of mine from Boston University developed, I think more than 20 years ago. But you know, now we have better technology for creating that linkage and the, you know, the idea of kind of ops-oriented frameworks is pretty pervasive now, so I think it's um, you know time for another serious attempt at it. Right, and do you think doing it this way, right, with the, with the BizOps Coalition, you know, getting a collection of, of, of kind of like-minded individuals and companies together, and actually even having a manifesto, which we're making this declarative statement of, of principles and values, you think that's what it takes to kind of drive this, you know, kind of beyond the experiment and actually, you know, get it done and really start to see some results in in, uh, in production in the field? I think certainly um, no one vendor or organization can pull this off single-handedly. It does require a number of organizations collaborating and working together. So I think a coalition is a good idea and a manifesto is just a good way to kind of lay out what you see as the key principles of the idea and that makes it much easier for everybody to understand and act on yeah I, I think it's just it's really interesting having you know having them written down on paper and having it just be so clearly articulated both in terms of the of the values as well as as the uh, the principles and, and the values, you know, business outcomes matter, trust and collaboration, data-driven decisions, which is number three of four, and then learn, respond, and pivot. It, it doesn't seem like those should have to be spelled out so clearly, but, but obviously it helps to have them there. You can stick them on the wall and kind of remember what your priorities are, but you're the data guy, you're the analytics guy, uh, and a big piece of this is data and analytics and moving to data-driven decisions. And principle number seven says, you know, 
today's organizations generate more data than humans can process and informed decisions can be augmented by machine learning and artificial intelligence. Right up your alley, you know, you've talked a number of times on kind of the many stages of analytics um, and how that's evolved over, over time. You know, it, as you think of analytics and machine learning driving decisions beyond supporting decisions, but actually starting to make decisions in machine time, what's that, what's that think for you? What does that make you, you know, start to think, wow, this is, this is going to be pretty significant? Yeah, well, you know, this has been a long-term interest of mine. Um, the last generation of AI, I was very interested in expert systems. And then um, I think uh, more than 10 years ago, I wrote an article about automated decision-making using um, what was available then, which was rule-based approaches. Um, but, you know, this addresses an issue that we've always had with analytics and AI. Um, you know, we, we tended to refer to those things as providing decision support. The problem is that if the decision maker didn't want their support, didn't want to use them in order to make a decision, they didn't provide any value. And so the nice thing about automating decisions um, with now contemporary AI tools is that we can ensure that data and analytics get brought into the decision without any possible disconnection. Now, I think humans still have something uh, to add here, and we often will need to examine how that decision is being made and maybe even have the ability to override it. But in general, I think at least for, you know, repetitive tactical decisions um, involving a lot of data, we want most of those, I think, to be at least um, recommended, if not totally made by an algorithm or an AI-based system. And that, I believe, would add to um, the quality and the precision and the accuracy of decisions in, in most organizations. You know, I think I think you just answered my next question before I before I asked it. You know, we had Dr. Robert Gates on, a former uh, Secretary of Defense, on a, a few years back, and we were talking about machines and machines making decisions. And he said at that time, you know, the only weapon systems uh, that actually had an automated trigger on it were on the North Korea and South Korea border. Um, everything else, as you said, had to go through some person before the final decision was made. And my question is, you know, what are kind of the attributes? of the decision that enable us to more easily automate it? And then how do you see that kind of morphing over time, both as the, the data to support that, as well as our comfort level, um, enables us to turn more and more actual decisions uh, over to the machine? Well, yeah, as I suggested, we need um, data and um, the data that we have to kind of train our models has to be um, high quality and current, and we, we need to know the outcomes of that data. You know, um, most machine learning models, at least in business, are supervised, and that means we need to have labeled outcomes in the, in the training data. But, I, you know, um, the pandemic that we're living through is a good illustration of the fact that the, the data also have to be reflective of current reality. And you know, one of the things that we're finding out quite frequently these days is that um, the data that we have do not reflect you know, what it's like to do business in a pandemic. Um, I wrote a little piece about this recently with Jeff Cam at Wake Forest University. We called it Data Science Quarantined. And uh, we interviewed somebody who said, you know, it's amazing what eight weeks of zeros will do to your demand forecast. We just don't really know what happens in a pandemic. Um, our models maybe have to be put on the shelf for a little while and until we can develop some new ones or we can get some other guidelines into making decisions. So I think that's one of the key things with automated decision-making. We have to make sure that the data from the past, and you know, that's all we have, of course, is a good guide to you know, what's happening in the present and in the future as far as we understand it. 
Yeah, I, I used to joke when we started this calendar year, 2020 was finally the year that we know everything with the benefit of hindsight. But it turned out <laughs> 2020 is the year we found out we actually know nothing and everything we that's thought we knew is anyway. not what we knew. But I want to I want to follow up on that because, you know, it did suddenly change everything, right? We got this light switch moment. Everybody's working from home. Now we're many, many months into it and it's going to continue for a while. I saw your interview with uh, Bernard Marr and you had a really interesting comment that now we have to deal with this change. We don't have a lot of data. And you talked about hold, fold, or double down. And, and I can't think of a more, you know, kind of appropriate metaphor for driving the value of the biz ops when now your whole portfolio strategy um, needs to really be questioned. And, and you know, you have to be really uh, well uh, executing on what you are holding, <laughs> what you're folding, and what you're doubling down with this completely new environment. Well, yeah, and I hope I, I did this in the interview. I would like to say that I came up with that term, but it actually um, came from a friend of mine who's a senior executive at GenPact. And um, I um, used it mostly to talk about AI and AI applications, but I think you could, you could use it much more broadly to talk about your entire sort of portfolio of digital projects. You need to think about, well, um, Given some constraints on resources and a difficult economy for a while, which of our projects do we want to keep going on pretty much the way we were? And which ones um, are not that necessary anymore? You see a lot of that in AI because we had so many pilots. Somebody told me, you know, we've got more pilots around here than O'Hare Airport in, in AI. Um, and then the, the ones that involve double down, they're even more important to you. They are, you know, a lot of organizations have found this out um, in the pandemic on digital projects. It's more and more important for customers to be able to interact with you um, digitally. And so you certainly wouldn't want to um, cancel those projects or put them on hold. So you double down on them, get them done faster and, and better. Right, right. Uh, another another thing that came up in my research that that you quoted um, was was from Jeff Bezos talking about the great bulk of what we do is quietly but meaningfully improving core operations. You know, I think that is so core to this concept of not AI and, and machine learning in kind of the general sense, which which gets way too much buzz, but really applied, right? Applied to a specific problem, and that's where you start to see the value. And you know, the the BizOps. Uh, manifesto is, is is calling it out in this particular process, but I'd just love to get your perspective, as you know, you speak generally about this topic all the time. But how people should really be thinking about where are the applications where I can apply this technology to get direct business uh, value. Yeah, well, you know, uh, even talking about automated decisions, um, uh, the kind of once in a lifetime decisions. Uh, the ones that um, A.G. Laffley, the former CEO of, of Procter & Gamble, used to call the big swing decisions. You only get a few of those, he said, in your tenure as CEO. Those are probably not going to be the ones that you're automating, in part because um, you don't have much data about them. You're you know, only making them a few times. And in part because um, they really require that big picture thinking and the ability to kind of anticipate the future that the, the best human decision makers um, have. Um, but um, in general, I think with AI, the projects that are working well are, you know, what I call the low hanging fruit ones. The, some people even refer to, it, refer to it as boring AI. So, you know, sucking data out of a contract in order to compare it to, uh, bill of lading for what arrived at your supply chain. Companies can save or make a lot of money with that kind of comparison. It's not the most exciting thing, but AI, as you suggest, is really good at those narrow kinds of tasks. Um, it's not so good at the, at the really big moonshots like curing cancer or you know, figuring out well, what's the best stock or bond under all circumstances or even autonomous vehicles, um, we, we made some great progress in that area, but everybody seems to agree that they're not going to be perfect for quite a while. And we really don't want to be driving around them, um, in them very much unless they're you know good and 
all kinds of weather and with all kinds of pedestrian traffic and, you know, that sort of thing. Right. That's funny you bring up contract management. I had a buddy years ago that had a, a startup around contract management. And I was like, and this was way before we had the compute power today and, and cloud proliferation. I said, you know, how, how can you possibly build software around contract management? It's language, it's legalese, it's very specific. And he's like, Jeff, we just need to know where's the contract and when does it expire and who's the signatory? And he built a business on those, you know, very simple little facts that weren't being covered because there were contracts from people's drawers and files and homes and Lord only knows. So it, it's really interesting, as you said, these kind of low hanging fruit opportunities where you can extract a lot of business value without trying to, you know, boil the ocean. Yeah, I mean, if you're Amazon, um, uh, Jeff Bezos thinks it's important to have some kind of billion dollar projects. And he, he even says it's important to have a billion dollar failure or two um, every year. But I think most organizations probably are better off being a little less aggressive and you know sticking to um, what AI has been doing for a long time, which is you know making smarter decisions based on based on data. Right. So Tom, I want to shift gears one more time before before we let you go on on kind of a new topic for you. Not really new, but you know not not uh, the vast majority of of your publications, and that's the new way to work. You know as as the pandemic hit in mid-March, right, and we had this light switch moment, everybody had to work from home and it was, you know, kind of crisis and get everybody set up. Well, you know, now we're five months, six months, seven months, a number of companies have said that people are not going to be going back to work for a while. And so we're going to continue on this for a while. And then even when it's not what it is now, it's not going to be what it was before. So, you know, I wonder, and I know you, you, uh, you teased, you're working on a, a new book, you know, some of your thoughts on, you know, kind of this new way uh, to work and, and, and the human factors in this new, this new kind of reality that we're kind of evolving into, I guess. Yeah, and this was an interest of mine. I think um, back in the 90s, I wrote an article called, um, I co-authored an article called Two Cheers for the Virtual Office. And you know, it was just starting to emerge then. Some people were very excited about it. Some people were skeptical. And uh, we said two cheers rather than three cheers because clearly there's some shortcomings. And you know, I keep seeing these pop up. It's it's great that we can work from our homes. It's great that we can accomplish most of what we need to do with a digital interface. But um, you know, things like innovation and creativity, and certainly um, uh, a good um, happy social life kind of requires some face-to-face -face contact every now and then. And so I, you know, I think we'll go back to an environment where there is some of that. Um, we'll have um, times when people convene in one place so they can get to know each other face-to-face -face and learn from each other that way. And most of the time, I think it's a huge waste of people's time to commute into the office every day and to, jump on airplanes to to um, give every little um, uh, sales call or give every little presentation. Uh, we just have to really narrow down what are the circumstances where face-to-face -face contact really matters and when can we get by with, with digital. You know, I think one of the things in my current work I'm finding is that even when you have AI-based decision-making, you really need a good platform in which that all takes place. So in addition to these virtual platforms, we need to develop platforms that kind of structure the, the workflow for us and tell us what we should be doing next and make automated decisions when necessary. And I think that ultimately is a big part of BizOps as well. It's not just the intelligence of an AI system, but it's the flow of work that kind of keeps things moving smoothly throughout your organization. Yeah, I think such such a huge opportunity, as you just said, because I, I forget the stats on how often we're interrupted with notifications between email, text, Slack, Asana, Salesforce, the list goes on and on. So, you know, to, to, to put an AI layer between the person and all these systems that are begging for your attention, and you've written a you know a book on the attention economy, which is a whole other topic. We'll say for another day. You know, it it really begs, it really begs for some assistance because you know you just can't get him picked, you know, every two minutes and really get quality work done. It's just not, 
it's just not realistic. And, and you know, and I don't think that's the future that we're looking for. I agree, totally. All right, Tom. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really uh, enjoyed the conversation. I got to dig into the library. It's very long, so I'm, I'm, I might start at the attention economy. I haven't read that one. And to me, I think that's the fascinating thing in which we're living. So thank you for your time and uh, great to see you. My pleasure, Jeff. Great to be here. All right, take care. All right, he's Tom. I'm Jeff. You are watching the continuing coverage of the BizOps Manifesto Unveil. Thanks for watching theCUBE. We'll see you next time.